Today, the plaintiff will wrap up their case as we have found more witnesses that were printed in the paper. Today's testimonies are found in the Hazel Green Herald from Hazel Green in Wolf County, Kentucky, dated December 22, 1904. Other information will be notated from other newspaper sources. While it did not look good for the defense already during this trial, two men would testify that would be considered very sensational by the newspapers. Robert Cheney and James Mann would testify that they were offered money to kill attorney Markham, and Henry Hurst would be called back to the stand for cross-examination. We will also hear the testimonies of Mary Jane Markham Johnson, Ned Markham, and W.P. Hampton. There was also a motion to dismiss the jury and an affidavit from Fountner that will be read into the court record. Buckle your seatbelts. The last bit of the plaintiff's case will be covered in today's episode. All aboard the Kentucky Tennessee Living Time Machine. Please fasten your seatbelts and keep your arms and legs inside of the vehicle at all times. But to get going, we need your help. We still need to fire up that time machine to transport us. Please help us by clicking on the like, subscribe, and bell notification buttons down below. Not only does this fire up the time machine, but it convinces YouTube that we need a bigger time machine to reach more people who love history as much as you do. Now, back to our story. The Hazel Green Herald's Perspective It is very unusual that there is a summary of the testimonies given before we read what the newspaper reported that Cheney and Mann had said on the stand. This must have been shocking testimony to everyone who sat in Judge Benton's courtroom. There are very few witnesses in the newspaper that was given such an introduction. Quote, the testimony brought out in the trial of the Markham damage suit Friday was the most sensational yet given by the witnesses for the plaintiff. According to the testimony of Robert Cheney and James Mann, they were approached by James Hargis with the proposition to kill Markham, but both of them declined the alleged offer. Unquote. Each of these witnesses would be offered a different bribe to carry out the assassination of Markham. Judge Hargis evidently knew what would entice each of the men to get them to do his bidding. Hargis would brag that he was untouchable in the Breathitt County court system and that if he wanted something done, then it would be done without worry from legal ramifications. The Testimony of Robert Cheney Robert Cheney would be the first to testify. It seems that he had been called to the Hargis store for a meeting. Cheney would tell everyone on the stand what happened next. Quote, Cheney stated that he had been sent for by Hargis, and after going to his private office on the second floor of the Hargis store, Judge Hargis offered him $500 if he would kill Markham. Hargis was to furnish the gun and assistance of Curtis Jett, unquote. We kept wondering why Cheney was chosen for this task. While he might have been a Hargis man, how did they know to trust him? Well, it seems that Cheney did not have the best of reputations in Breathitt County. One answer might be the death of Chad Salyer. According to the Mount Sterling Advocate dated October 14, 1903, at Elkatawa in Breathitt County, a drunken quarrel broke out between Salyer and Cheney at a blind tiger. Salyer was accused of killing William Estes in Oakdale a few weeks prior to the quarrel. Cheney killed Salyer over the matter. Found in the evening bulletin on January 14, 1904, there had been livestock that had been stolen. Both hogs and sheep were among the missing animals. James Riddle and Mrs. Sarah Haddix implicated Robert Cheney in the larceny. When they went to arrest Cheney, he pulled out his gun, aimed it at the face of Deputy Sheriff Joe Moore, and then dared him to move. Cheney was allowed to escape his arrest but still under indictment for the murder of Chad Sayer. According to the Adair County News, on March 10, 1905, Cheney would be convicted by trial of jury and sentenced to 12 years in prison for the murder of Chad Sayer. He was transferred to the Powell County Prison for safekeeping. We do find it curious that James Hargis did not offer legal help or advice to Cheney, but simply offered him $500 for the killing of Markham. 
This really says a lot about how Hargis felt about Markham because Hargis would end up paying a higher price for the other deeds surrounding the witnesses than for the murder itself. The Testimony of James Mann We could not find out very much information about James Mann. According to his own testimony, he was in trouble in the court system for an indictment of murder. We could not find out who this was that man was accused of killing at the time of this video. However, we update things as we find them, so hopefully this will be also updated. But Judge Hargis felt that this could be a way to get man to kill Markham for him. Returning to the Hazel Green Herald for this testimony. Quote, James Mann said that Judge Hargis had told him that he controlled the courts of Breathitt County and that he would kill Markham, the charge of murder, which was then resting against him, would be dismissed at the next term of court. These offers were made, the witnesses declared, a short time before the assassination of Markham by Curtis Jett and Tom White. Mann stated that after he had refused the alleged offer made by Hargis, the latter sent for him again and told him that he had arranged to have Markham killed, but that he wanted him to shadow Markham for a few days until the work had been accomplished, unquote. So, even though Judge Hargis had stated that he had found someone to do the job, he still wanted man to follow Markham. We can only surmise that the purpose behind this was to keep Markham in fear of his life before he was killed. Or perhaps to make sure that Markham did not get the chance to leave town until everything was ready to assassinate him. The Testimony of W.P. Hampton We find it very interesting that here we have the testimony of a banker. This banker was not called into court because of any actions that he had done on his own. Instead, he was called in about the questionable amounts of money that had been transferred into the accounts that may have led to the murder for hire scenario. Returning to the Hazel Green Herald for this testimony, quote, W.P. Hampton, cashier for the Winchester Bank, told of carrying a message to Mose Feltner from B.F. French to the effect that French and Alex Hargis wanted to see Feltner at the bank that night. Mr. Hampton also stated that the four defendants in this case were depositors in the bank. He says that several days ago, Felix Feltner had deposited between $900 and $1,000 in the bank. Felix Feltner is the man that Ruck Cotton Gang says was engaged by French to spirit the witnesses away last week. Mr. Hampton also reluctantly stated that Ed Callahan had drawn $500 from the bank the latter part of last week, and it had been charged to the account of one of the Hargis brothers. This was the day it was alleged Callahan went to Cincinnati, unquote. Whether or not this money was switched in the accounts between Callahan and Hargis is up for the debate. However, the movement of $1,000 and later $500 does line up with the testimonies previously given about the prices made for removing of witnesses and the assassination of Markham. The Testimony of Mrs. Mary Jane Markham Johnson One of the strongest witnesses in the case would be Mrs. Mary Jane Markham Johnson, who was the sister to J.B. Markham. She would testify that she had spoken to Curtis Jett, and that he had not only confessed to her about the murder, but also that he was paid for it. She would also testify to the fear and stress that her brother was under before he was killed. Returning to the Hazel Green Herald for this testimony, Quote, Attorneys for the plaintiff made the avowal that Jet had said to Mrs. Johnson in answer to a question as to who killed her brother, quote, I fired the shot, but Hargis Money did it, unquote. Witness testified that Markham did not go out on the streets of Jackson except when accompanied by members of his family, unquote. So, by Johnson's testimony, we have a solid link to the idea that the death of Markham was indeed a murder for hire. A motion to dismiss the jury. The defense felt that there was now grounds for a dismissal of the jury. In layman's terms, this was a plea for the judge to throw out certain evidences, testimonies, or rule that either a mistrial or throw out the case completely. Returning to the Hazel Green Herald, quote, a motion from the defense in the Markham suit to dismiss the jury was overruled. The famous Feltner affidavit was read in court. 
The attorneys for the plaintiff made sensational allegations concerning the alleged plan to buy off witnesses, unquote. While we do not have a copy of the Feltner affidavit currently, we can surmise that this was a very damaging document to the case of the defense. From the wording of the newspaper article, the affidavit must have been a sworn testimony to the plan to have the witnesses paid off so that they could not testify in court against them. This was read in court in front of the jury for their consideration in this matter. The Testimony of Ned Markham Now we have the testimony of Ned Markham, brother to James Markham. In his testimony, we will find that he had knowledge that his brother had went to the Breathitt County officials for protection so that he could wind up his affairs and leave the area. He was denied this protection from the officials and no effort was made to stop his assassination. Returning to the Hazel Green Herald for this testimony, quote, Ned Markham said that he knew his brother made a public appeal to the officials of Breathitt County to protect him until he could wind up his business affairs and get away but that the defendants made no effort to protect him from assassination, unquote. Who were these officials? Were they Ed Callahan and Judge Hargis? Or could other officials been involved? If not Hargis and Callahan, could they have also been privy to the upcoming assassination and did not want to get involved and possibly killed themselves over the matter? The Cross-Examination of Henry Hurst for the first time in court, we have a testimony through cross-examination that would be thrown out for the consideration of the jury. Why? Did the testimony really have any bearing on the case itself? Or was it because the answer was not what the defense wanted? Returning to the Hazel Green Herald for this testimony, quote, Henry Hurst was called for cross-examination and asked when it was that he had the conversation with Alex Hargis in which Hargis told him that if he continued to board at Markham's, he would have to quit working for them. Witness said that it occurred more than 13 years ago, that he had worked for the Hargises at a time since then. The court ruled out all the testimony relating to this testimony, unquote. So, basically, we have Henry Hurst boarding with Markham. There had been hatred between Markham and the Hargises for some time after the election that went badly. Was Hearst told basically to pick a side? That he couldn't live at the residence of one party if he was going to work for the other party. That the warning of Markham to the movements and plans of Hargis's would not be tolerated. Did Hearst take these statements that Hargis had made as a threat? Would you have taken them as a threat if you were Hearst? After all this, all of the evidence that the plaintiff had to show was now finished. The court then called for a recess for a couple of days so that the defense could prepare their case. We will pick up next week with the defense case. Thank you. We at Kentucky Tennessee Living would like to thank you for watching our video series on the Appalachian Feuds. Don't forget to hit that like button as the more likes we receive, the more likely YouTube is to suggest our videos to other viewers. Also, to receive notice when we upload a new video, be sure to subscribe and click that bell notification button. We thank you for continuing to support Kentucky Tennessee Living as we are discovering the mysteries in Appalachian history.